I was just uh, so blessed by the worship and then uh, by that prayer and by your encouragement. Um, I'm, I'm just so honored to be here. And I, I just want to say also a special thanks to that uh, search team that just did a great job on your behalf, on our behalf. Um, I, I want to say a special thanks to Craig and Adam, to Carrie and Amy, as they've come around Becky and I in this season. And it's just been a wonderful connection. I want to thank the elder board. What a joy it is to work with, but also under their spiritual leadership. We have a great board here. Um, And, and, and I also want to say it's, it's all of us, right? You that are in uh, New Milford, those in Waterbury, those in Derby in the Valley, uh, those who are online and those here at Bethel campus. Uh, we're in this together. We're trying to ignite a passion for Jesus Christ in Connecticut, New England, the entire world, which is not an easy task, but we're called to it. And so we're responsible to God before him to do that well. Um, and we're trying to do that by arising and shining for Jesus Christ in this season. And uh, so thank you for being here. Thanks for being a part of it. It's an honor. I, had, uh, I want to share a verse that has really kind of shaped my life. Um, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says this. Uh, it says, Christ gave uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, underline this part, to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach Unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The idea is that we grow in Christ and that pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, we're supposed to equip the congregation to do that. So we equip through teaching. We equip through walking with you and beside you. We equip through um, finding healing in the places where there's deep hurt or hope, where there's hopelessness. We, we want to equip by saying, hey, these are your gifts. This is how God has equipped you in a unique way from everyone else. And, and then also open your eyes to the possibilities, the possibilities to arise and shine for Jesus Christ in your places of life and work and ministry and family. So the passage today is about work life. It's about what we do Monday through Friday, or maybe it's Monday through Sunday. Maybe it's a 24-7 job. It's the idea that, that we want to live for God in the whole of life. And we need to do what we can to kind of break that divide between Sunday and Monday. So what you do this time tomorrow matters. But there's a popular bumper sticker that you can find online that says this. I'm in no hurry. I'm on my way to work. <laughs> and, and it's this idea that maybe you felt like that. Uh, maybe you're driving behind that person on I-84. Th this idea that, that seven out of 10 Americans who self-report say, in some level, I'm disappointed with my job, what I do for work. Someone asked a worker, says, how long does it take you to get to work? He says, I, I'm at work about a half an hour after I clock in. It just takes time. So this attitude is unfortunate because... Um, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time working. We're going to spend a lot of time on the job. We're going to spend a lot of time doing this. And if we don't enjoy it, then there's a challenge. And that's what Ecclesiastes highlights. This on my first day in my new job. So <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about work. Um, I've been thinking about what do I love about work? What do I not like about work? Why is work sometimes way too important to me? What is it that I hope to get out of my work? And what is it that I hope to put into my work? What has changed in my view towards work and the lot in life that God has given me over the different seasons? And where is God in all of this? So this is my first message, uh, official message as lead pastor of teaching. Um, it's not about me. It's about the word of God. And it's about our, together, our work lives. So Dorothy Sayers said this. She said that the church has historically kind of fallen short. She said, oftentimes we tell the worker, be good and come back next Sunday. But she said, the thing that we should tell the Christian Christ-following carpenter is make good tables. We, we should tell the educator, be a good teacher. We should tell the chef, make great bread. We should tell the um, architect, draw good buildings, the custodian, clean your windows well. We, we, we should tell uh, everybody, like, what you do matters, right? We want the internet to work. We, we want the supply chain to happen so that when we go to the grocery store, the food that we want is there, right? We want realtors and lawyers and bankers and septic 
tank people. You can tell we're in the house purchasing process. So we, we want all of those people to do their job really, really well so that we can do our jobs well. But Miroslav Volf, fellow Connecticut professor at Yale, said this in his book on work. God's curse after the fall expresses the fact that alienation is inherent to the human experience of work. There's something about what we do and what we experience in the workplace that feels alienating. So we're gonna look at work in the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's a bit of a challenge, right? We say all scripture is God breathed. Ecclesiastes is inspired by God. It's wisdom literature. How does Ecclesiastes teach us about work and how can it guide and instruct us in the things? How do we find truth when he's so pessimistic about it? Ecclesiastes chapter one, beginning of verse one, says this. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son Solomon, who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. And the first issue out of the gate, what do people get for all the hard work under the sun? And here's his answer. Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises, the sun sets, and hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south, and then it turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run to the sea, but the sea's never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers, and it flows out into the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. Have a good day. Let's finish there. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> No matter what we see, how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we're not content. I call this wet blanket theology, right? The cup is definitely half empty for him. But what's, what, what I love about it is its reality, right? There's a part of what we do. He uses the word toil a lot, the toil with the toil that you face. And he says, there's something about work that's wearisome. There's something about work that's difficult. There's something about work when you don't have work that you're trying to fight and find employment, or maybe you're in a spot of underemployment, and maybe you feel Miroslav Volf's, man, there's an alienation inherent in the human experience of work. That's where our passage begins in Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse 16. It says, and this too is a, weir a serious problem. NIV said it's a grievous evil. People leave the world no better when they came. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under the cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry, and you say, yes, that's my job. Yes, that's my path. No, that's my commute, that's I-84. Frustrated, discouraged, and angry. So when we think about work, we think about vocation. Um, this may or may not be your experience of it. This may be a place where you are currently struggling, or maybe you're in school and your parents say, that's your job, and you're like, I, I get Ecclesiastes, right? Uh, Tom Nelson said this, daily we're confronted with the sobering reality that our work, the workers that we work with, and the workplaces in which we work are not as God originally designed them. So what wisdom, what vision can the writer of Ecclesiastes get of us? He says, mate, time out, let's take a second look. I, I like that. So I said, hey, let's, let's get through 16 and 17, let's get to 18, because he pauses and he says, wait a second. Even so, I have noticed one thing, at least, that is good. It is good for people to eat and drink and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life that God has given them and accept their lot in life. To accept the toil against the toil. He says, wait a minute, something about work is good. And there's something about work that is from God. And there's something about work that is the lot that God has given us and, and it may be that that lot right now is a summer job. It may be that lot right now is an apprenticeship that you know is leading somewhere better than that. It may be that you're in school or maybe you're on kind of that ramp up or maybe you're in a spot where you're saying, I need to understand that God is about work and he cares about work, that he sees me in this. Ecclesiastes chapter three, he wrote, I concluded that there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can, and people should eat, drink, and enjoy the fruit of their labor, for these are gifts from God. So when you think about work, Ecclesiastes will say, man, there's a, there's a challenge to the work life. But it also says, hey, there's a, there's a God piece in the work life, that God is at work 
And I think in two ways, it's really helpful. In two ways, it's God is work in us and God is at work through us. So God is at work in us, in our work, shaping us, honing us, creating in us, teaching us. Talk to a, a, a person who's been in the work life for 30 plus years and they will often reflect back on those, those toilsome lots early in career saying I learned things there that impact me now. So God is at work in us, but he's also at work through us. So our work may be a place where we can bring blessing to others, we can create the right kind of culture in the workplace. We can do something with coworkers that, that is impactful or, or brings about flourishing or for the common good. But we can be about a cause. We can be uh, shaped by and then effective through the things that we do in our workplace. The New Testament says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart because you're working for the Lord, not for human masters. That's something good to remind ourselves of. I'm not working for the man in the corner. I'm working for God in this space. And what is God doing in me? And then what is God doing through me for the sake of other people? The Lord is into the redemption business. And it first of all starts with our own souls. It's about seeing who God is and the love that we have in Jesus Christ and coming to a place where we trust in Christ alone. But his redemption work then radiates out and it impacts what we do every day. It is not, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. It's not, boy, I hope I can win the lottery, then I can quit working. It may change the kind of work that you do if you win the lottery. And then let's have a conversation. But, but our work matters to God and it's a gift of God. And the very next verse he says, but what if work really works? Right, you, you, you're working at it, you're embracing it and you find success, you find uh, notoriety, you find rewards, he says this, it is a good thing to receive wealth from the Lord and good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift of God. Enjoy your work, and sometimes God brings blessings, but Ecclesiastes says, well now, here's another challenge, here's another toil, be careful, because we, we can't, get too much out of the work or too much out of the blessings. And he waves a flag in chapter five, uh, a few verses earlier. He says, how meaningless to think that wealth can bring true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. What is good in is wealth, but except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers. People who work hard sleep well, and whether they eat a little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. There's another serious problem I see under the sun hoarding riches harms the saver. So, so the caution flag is, okay, what if it works? What if I've got a little space and God has blessed me with more ability to spend or use? And the question is, does that really bring happiness? And he would say, you know, there's a sense where God blesses, but then he says, be careful. And the question, you know, continues to rise, does wealth bring happiness? And again, study after study show, no, wealth doesn't bring, stuff doesn't bring happiness to the soul. There was a study done that was talked about in the LA Times where they went to a college campus and they handed out Starbucks gift cards. And they said, we're gonna have three different groups of people. The, the first group, we're gonna give a Starbucks gift card to them and say, hey, this is just a gift to you. I want you to go drink coffee. Just take it and spend it on yourself. Enjoy. And then they asked the college student, how did that feel? The, the second one was that they would, um, I'm sorry, that's the second group. First group is give it to a college kid just to go drink your coffee. Second one, give it to a college kid who then passes it on to another college kid. And the third group said, I, I'm going to take this and I'm going to invite someone to coffee with me and, and have the coffee together and have a conversation around that. And then they said, you know, was it fun? What kind of happiness? Self-reporting on the three groups. And they found that the group that said, hey, let's drink coffee together and have a conversation self-reported the greatest level of happiness. The LA Times called that the buying experience, which is a little bit vague. Um, <laughs> but they said if, if there's three groups of people, one is the consumers, one is the giveawayers, and one is like, let's share this together. They said that group. And, and they said the idea here is if you do something with someone else, you treat someone to a meal, take someone to a concert, you take someone to a game. You, you're like, this would be a lot of fun just to give away. It'd be a lot of fun just to experience yourself, but it is even better to do it together. So I, I, need a, uh, I need a volunteer to come up. One of you two guys, come up here. Okay. 
Just one of you. Yeah, your brothers. Who's going to go first, right? Okay, so there it is. It's not Starbucks, but it's Cinnamon Churros Cafe. And you can, one, you can just go and use it yourself. Number two, you can go and bring your brother or some other. You can just give it away to someone, or you can say, let's sit down and have a cup of coffee together. So I want you to decide, and then I want you to let me know how much you enjoyed that. Cinnamon Churros Cafe. Okay, so there it is. So think about this. That's all the volunteer role that you have. You just have to... And I'm sort of happy because I gave that away. So, but it'd be more fun just to sit down and have the coffee with you. So he, here's the idea. Ephesians says this. Uh, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others. So if God grants a little bit of space, then, then find ways, it says, to give that away. The Bible calls that the Abrahamic covenant. There's a passage in the Old Testament that says, we are blessed to be a blessing. The LA Times says it's a buying experience. I think the Bible's clear, blessed to be a blessing. So if work works, had some good friends that said in retirement, it's not retirement, it's refirement. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to redeploy myself for the kingdom of God. How do I take what God has given me and give it away? Now, Becky and I have just been here a short time and this past Wednesday night, uh, we went out to the food pantry here at the Bethel campus. And uh, boy, talk about being a blessing to others, right? I showed up and there was just tons and tons of people volunteering, lots and lots of people leading in significant ways. We, we were just doing our best to keep up with everybody that's out there working. And it was really a significant experience of one of the ways that Walnut Hill lives us out and, and saying, how can we take the blessing that God has given us and be a blessing to others? And I want to encourage you at all the campuses that, that you may not be able to do that um, every other week or once a month down in Derby, but maybe once in the next 12 months, maybe on a really cold winter day, show up and say, I want to be a part of seeing how God has blessed us and be a blessing to other people. When God blesses, how do we pour that out on others? Then Ecclesiastes goes on, and verse 20 is an interesting verse. I titled it to think or not think. Well, first of all, he said, I've taken a second look and saying, hey, this is what's good about work and I wanna encourage you to think about how your work and what God is doing in you and what God is doing through you. I want you to think deeply about what do we do with the space that God has given us. And then you get to verse 20 and it says, God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. The NIV says they seldom reflect on the days of their life. ESV says, for he will not much remember the days of his life. It's almost like they're saying, hey, maybe not think, just kind of go for it. But wisdom literature is about thinking. The scripture is about pondering and saying, what does God want me to do in these spaces and places? Like for work, it says, his place of ministry, I like to think about all of us are called it may be vocational ministry, it might be marketplace ministry, but you're called. You're called to arise and shine for Jesus Christ. And it may be uh, a means of generosity. It may be a tool of refinement. That's not much fun to think about, but God is using my work as a tool of refinement in my own heart and soul to better prepare me for something in the future. It, it may be a place of witness, it may be an opportunity to impact culture and create common good. It, it may be any number of different approaches to saying God is in this, working in me and through me. So, so what's going on in verse 20? It's like Solomon looks out and he says, there are some workers who just see God and trust God and they don't ponder the days of their lives very deeply. I think about Brother Lawrence. 1600s Carmelite monk who wrote the wonderful book, short little book, Practicing the Presence of God. And in this book, he talks about experiencing God in the workplace, and his work was peeling potatoes for the monastery. And I, I remember reading that at a particularly toilsome time in my life, working one of those awful summer jobs, and thinking, well, maybe God's at work here. So, so it's like Solomon sees these people who are optimistic and future-focused, 
But, but I think what Solomon is describing here, it, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. He's saying there are some people that God keeps those people so busy enjoying life that they don't brood much over the past. And for all of us, I think we need to put on our thinking caps and say, I want to live an integrated life in all of life so that Sunday connects to Monday, connects back to Sunday, connects to Monday again. That what I do matters. God sees it and God's using it. God is stirring in my heart so that I can become more um, deep in my understanding of who God is, but also I can be a witness. I can arise and shine even in that space for God's good. So your work matters. We're called, we're equipped, we're gifted. Work is worship. We don't worship work. I remember reading Proverbs 6 when I was a kid that said a little extra sleep a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. It may be perhaps that my dad read that verse to me when I was 16. <laughs> it's this idea, what, what, what we do matters, and we can't be lazy, but we can't worship work, right? We don't sacrifice relationships and the things that really matter. Colossians says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Be, in, it, it, be focused, be intense about it, but you're working for God, so take your cues from God. You're not working for man. So I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And as we kind of just pause and reflect on this time tomorrow, just pause for a minute and think, what are you doing this time tomorrow? And acknowledge that what you're doing this time tomorrow matters to God. And this time tomorrow is a place that God is working in you to bring about Christ-likeness. He's shaping you. He's, he's honing you. He's preparing you. And perhaps he's using you to shine a light to people that you don't even know that are watching. And so I, I want to just pause and I want to think through that experience of work. And I invite you to bring that before God as we close in prayer here. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you, uh, first of all, for the work that you've given us. Uh, Solomon used words like toil and the lot in life, and it can seem really difficult, but that is some of our experience. And so I pray for grace and strength to accomplish what you have called us to do. God, I pray that we might find ways and spaces and places to arise and shine, that we might... Uh, not only allow your spirit to work in us, but through us to impact workplaces and culture, to find ways and spaces to bring about the common good and human flourishing, to, to be an encouragement to our coworkers, to uh, be a positive light to those that we come in interaction with, the, the, the challenging folks, the, uh, the person that works up, you know, wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. God, I pray that we might be who you want us to be in those spaces and places. And I pray that we might know you, follow you, proclaim you in the work that you say matters. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.